Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Lindsay Homewood. <laughs> Uh, so, I'm the uh, head of development at the Australian Federal Government's Digital Transformation Office. And we have a little bit of a problem <coughs> in Australia at the moment, which is that there are over 1,500 individual federal government websites that we know about. We think the number may actually be closer to about 2,200 at the moment. And that's a lot of websites. And the problem with the way that the information and services are delivered through those websites is that we expect people have a mental model of how they have to interact with government. We organize the information and those services and the delivery of that online around the way that the organizations within government are structured. And of course, people don't care about that. People just want to solve a problem, and they have to go to the government to do that sometimes. And so that leads to cases where you know, people who we do research with, they just say, well, I just wing it, to be honest. I really need the big picture. And then building on top of that, when people actually go out to start a business, they actually end up designing that business, that entire process that they go through, to minimize the level of interaction that they actually have to have with the government, which is sort of mind-blowing when you think about it, right? And you know, when we interview people who are doing similar sorts of things, they say, well, the whole experience has just been a case of scaling back my expectations about what's actually possible. And then even worse, people end up paying other people to interact with the government on their behalf, to sort of act as an intermediary and navigate that maze. And then, you know, we've got people who are saying similar things. They're saying that, you know, if you've got the experience, then uh, you, it's just going to distract you from actually doing your own business. It's just better to pay an expert to do, some, to do this for you. And even worse, the people that are acting as those brokers for the rest of government still have trouble interacting with government because it's that complicated for them. You know, we've got cases of people that have been on the phone to different government departments for you know, two hours and 30 minutes. Absolutely crazy. So we have a bit of a problem, which presents a pretty interesting challenge for us within the Australian government at the moment, which is that we need to try and do the hard work to make delivering services online and using services online simple for users. And to do that effectively, we need to understand the who, the what, the when, the where of people interacting with government, why they're even coming to us in the first place. And to solve that problem, we're sort of synthesizing a combination of design, mostly design, and a little bit of technology to deliver those services in a way that is clean, simple, easy to use, or clearer, simpler, and faster public services online. And that's what the Digital Transformation Office was created for in the Australian government, to help uh, the Australian government as a whole move forward in being able to deliver services in this way. So how do we actually make this happen? How do we do our work? Well, everything that we do within the DTO is about focusing on what the user need is, actually understanding why people are interacting with government, and then making sure that we're building services that are able to service those needs. And we do that by forming cross-functional teams of people from a bunch of different disciplines, not just technical ones as well. We have our developers, we've got our web operations, security, but also people who've got backgrounds in service design, product management, content writing, as well as just plain old sort of product management, or you know, delivery management, that sort of thing. And so our philosophy is if we get people from a bunch of different backgrounds, um, there's, they're going to bring a diversity of opinion um, together, and we're going to get the best possible outcome for the users. And this sort of harks back to this idea that we have, which is that the unit of delivery is the team. You know, and delivery itself is actually the responsibility of everybody. There's no one person that's just responsible for delivery. It's the responsibility of the entire team. An interesting thing from a tech perspective as well is that we take that to the next level and we say that the service delivery teams who are delivering that service, they have the responsibility of owning their own availability. They own the service end-to-end -end from inception to it going live. And once it's live as well. And so we have this whole process of validating early and often to make sure that the thing that we're building is the right thing for the user. Doing, doing that hard work to make, uh, to make it easy for the user. So we have like a discovery phase, which is really focused on sort of understanding what the journey is that users are going to be taking to be able to interact with government and why they're even coming to us in the first place. 
Uh, so we put these you know, big storyboards together, and we get an understanding about you know, what are the life events that have led up to uh, the person interacting with government. And then from that, we come up with a bunch of hypotheses that we then try and test with a bunch of uh, very minimal wireframes, and we do some prototyping of an app, um, and then we try and test that with the users uh, to, to basically validate those hypotheses that we've come up during that discovery phase to make sure that what we're building is actually the right thing before we invest too much effort in building the wrong thing, potentially. And then from that, once we work out what we're actually building, we go and actually build the thing. We take those working wireframes that we've got, um, and we, uh, we start filling out the code behind the scenes and build sort of a minimum viable product uh, to deliver that service to people. And the key point here is that what we're trying to do as an organization is to innovate on service, de uh, service delivery, not the actual technology itself. And to do that, we say that, well, let's try and standardize a bunch of the technology that we're using to make it easy for people to get on board and actually start delivering services in this way. And the interesting thing there is that we can take that and build a capability across all of government, because everybody has got familiarity with the same tools. They all work in roughly the same way. And we have a fairly opinionated way about the way that we work and the way that we use the technology. But that leads into a pretty good situation for government where we can actually start to onboard people faster into the, into the projects that we're kicking off to be able to deliver those services. And even better, we can actually take those contributions because we have a fairly opinionated technology stack and we can actually, uh, you know, because we're primarily using open source in what we do, we can then take what we're doing and actually contribute it back to the open source community so everybody can benefit from the stuff that we're doing. And again, this is about making the right thing easy for the people who have to work in the teams to do technical delivery. And Cloud Foundry is very much an important part of how we actually make this happen. It's part of that standardization that I was talking about a second ago. So what does delivery actually look like within the Australian government? So it looks for something a little bit like this. It looks like the number of deploys uh, over time increasing. So this is a particular uh, project that we were prototyping, a service that we were prototyping uh, back in October. And you can see there that there's a nice uptick to all the deploys over time. Um, and that actually, interestingly, maps to the number of contributors that were on the project as well. And so it looks a little bit something like this. We've got a bunch of different people who are working in like a local Git checkout, uh, and they're pushing those changes to GitHub. And then GitHub is then uh, kicking off a, a Jenkins deploy, so we have a CD pipeline for all this stuff. Uh, and then that's deploying everything to Cloud Foundry, and then the users are uh, accessing the application that's running on Cloud Foundry. That's it. It's pretty simple. That's our standardized pipeline that we use, regardless of what language the service is actually being written in. And then, of course, we make sure that we have very strong feedback loops throughout the whole process as well. So every time somebody makes a deploy, there's stuff that's dumped into Slack. Uh, same with uh, log messages, monitoring, all that sort of thing. There's one channel that the entire team is able to hang out in. They're able to see all the work that's happening um, across all the different technical streams. Um, and that results in something a bit like this. You know, this is the prototype that we, uh, that we ended up shipping a couple of months ago. And of course, true to, our, true to our open source spirit and nature, we've open sourced all that as well, and I invite you to go check that out. But the interesting thing about structuring delivery like this is that releases become a non-event, which is a little bit atypical for the way that software releases are typically handed in government, handled in government. And the other interesting thing here as well is that the process overall actually scaled quite nicely as we added contributors. There were very few challenges that we found when we were adding additional people to the team to be able to keep working in this way. We didn't have to retrofit a new process onto, onto the way that we were doing delivery. And the other interesting thing here as well is those contributions as a whole were, of, that were coming from the team weren't purely technical. We actually lowered the barrier of entry for other people, non-technical people within the team, to be able to contribute to the prototypes that we were building. And so if you look here at the contributions graph over time, you can see the number of contributions going up. And all the contributions that were coming through here, they were from not just purely technical backgrounds. In fact, cute little thing about this, the top two contributors to this particular project were actually non-technical. They're actually content writers. So we made sure that we gave the content writers the right tools to be able to work in Git, but not actually know that they were working in Git. Um, and all the changes that they made went through exactly the same pipeline uh, that all of the other technical changes were going through as well. And again, goes to the idea that a unit of delivery is the team, not individuals. 
So what do we think the teams actually need to be able to successfully do this delivery? Well, fundamentally, there's just a couple of very small things that they need. They need a way to get their code running in front of users so that we can get those very quick feedback loops to make sure that the thing that we're building is actually the right thing. They need some sort of insight into how that code is currently working or not, as the case may be, when we're making changes very, very quickly. We want to be able to recover from that and know what was going wrong. And then finally, we need to be able to get some sort of data to hypothesize about uh, user and system behavior, to validate those hypotheses about the overall service design that we're undertaking. And all of those three things add up to basically just mean safety in when you're making the changes to make sure that you know, it's going to work in a reliable and, and repeatable way, and confidence that what the team is building is actually the right thing for the user. So the way that we sort of view it is that there's this high-level service, and a service is made up of multiple apps. Um, maybe we're taking sort of like a microservices architecture where there's like a couple of small front-end apps and then a bunch of APIs behind the scenes. Uh, and then there's a platform that, sits, uh, that all of this stuff sits upon. And so we say, going back to that idea that the service delivery teams own their availability, that the service delivery teams own all of the applications, and, they, and we'll provide the infrastructure to make sure that they're able to stay up. And then we provide an underlying platform for them to be able to do that delivery on. And it's not just the Cloud Foundry piece, which we'll talk about in a second. And so the DTO is providing that platform for people within government to be able to do that delivery on. And so we're tentatively calling this cloud.gov.au. And you can obviously see the allusions to what 18F are doing with cloud.gov. Don't put this into your browser. It doesn't currently resolve. Um, but this is sort of the tentative name that we're giving it for the time being. And so the whole idea with cloud.gov.au is that we're trying to make it easy for teams to be able to run, change, and measure the applications that make a service up as a whole. And so there are basically just three things that we're trying to do there. We're just trying to make the act of deploying and releasing software simple, fast, and painless. We're trying to help the teams by working in the teams and showing them how the tools work, make that journey to go live. And then as part of doing that work in those teams, we're trying to help them understand and impart a whole bunch of operational knowledge that we have a lot of uh, on how to actually build a reliable, scalable digital service that's able to meet user needs but also stay up. And again, the whole idea with cloud.gov.eu is to make doing the right thing easy. And we view the platform as something that teams will be able to use all the way from the alpha prototyping that they're doing to the MVP that they're building, all the way through to the final live running of that service. So what is cloud.gov.au? Well, it's just these four things, really. And Cloud Foundry, you can see there, comes in at the app hosting and the database uh, layer. Um, so it's, it's you know, very fundamental to the way that we're doing all of this delivery. We make sure as well, though, that, uh, that all changes are going through a continuous deployment pipeline or a continuous delivery pipeline, depending on the risk profile of the agency. Um, and so we can't push changes into production any other way. All changes to production have to go through a CD pipeline. We also provide a very simple logging service to give those teams the insight into what's actually happening. Uh, across the stack. And we also provide a very simple monitoring service. And that's sort of an interesting point, because our sort of opinion on the way that monitoring should work is that the teams that are closest to delivering the service, the teams that are building the service, have, to be, have the best insights into what the important things are to actually be monitoring there. So rather than being super prescriptive about the sort of monitoring checks that should be run, we provide a very, very simple platform for them. Uh, to be able to write their own monitoring checks and actually version those monitoring checks alongside uh, the code that they're writing for the actual application itself. And whenever a continuous deployment pipeline uh, build gets kicked off, we also build a bunch of monitoring checks and we push that into the monitoring platform as well. So again, it's about making doing the right thing easy for those teams. And to do all of this effectively, we have to provide very clear integration points for building, testing, deploying, logging, measuring, and monitoring. And the, and the key point here is that it's about defining very clear interfaces and not dictating an implementation to the teams that are actually building those services. They're closest to it. They have the best context to be able to make the right decisions. We, we enable them to be able to do that. We don't dictate how they go about delivering that service. So obviously, Cloud Foundry is like a really, really key point in being able to make all of this stuff happen. This is where we were bootstrapping our first foundation. 
Uh, and the interesting thing there is that we're making sure that uh, all, you know, by sort of enshrining that good operational practice that all delivery teams get zero downtime deploys is just a standard part of using the cloud.gov.au platform. And we're also relying uh, really heavily on uh, a lot of the other work that other people in government around the world who are using Cloud Foundry have done. So we're taking great advantage of the AWS broker that AT&F have done a whole bunch of work on more recently, which basically allows us to use underlying AWS resources and expose them on Cloud Foundry, which is a great way of sort of speeding up the act of delivery. We don't have to deliver all of the different services. We can use a bunch of stuff that's already there and provided by AWS. And so we're using, we started out using Jenkins, and more recently we're, we're moving a little bit towards Circle CI, which is sort of neat. And so, you know, obligatory screenshot, we totally use it. And for this to work effectively, we need to have these clear integration points for building and testing and deploying, right? So the way that we do that is that we say that all teams have got to drop in two files into their repository, a CI build.sh and a CI deploy.sh. And so that's just the interface. We don't dictate the implementation of that. And we'll sort of stub out um, the basics of what's actually required to get the app running in the first place. But if teams want to be able to change the way that they do testing or the way that they do deployment, they just edit the files in their repository, and then they commit it, and then they push it. And that's it. They have the power to be able to do whatever they need to do. And so the interesting thing about this from, say, jumping from Jenkins through to Circle CI is that we can like, rely really heavily on environment variables, sort of extract out credentials and that sort of thing into the CI pipeline. But of course, through this approach, it actually becomes very trivial to move between different tools if you define this very simple interface and don't care so much about what the actual implementation is. So on the logging side of things, we use Greylog, uh, which is pretty neat. And the whole point about using Greylog is that we want this traceability throughout the entire stack. So we want to know all the way from the HTTP request being, uh, being captured by a load balancer uh, through to the application, through to the underlying platform and the database. Um, and we want you know, all the logs from AWS and whatnot all in one place so the teams are able to see from top to bottom how a request is being dealt with. Um, and this helps, I guess, on two fronts. Firstly, on the debugging and the troubleshooting front, but secondly, around the security, incident, and event management side of things. So the point that I want to leave with you today is that platform as a service is incredibly important to being able to accelerate delivery within your own organizations. But I fundamentally believe that the platform as a service is much bigger than just the application runtime, which we end up focusing so much on. So the whole point about having PaaS in place is that it's a tool to help you make doing the right thing easy for your users. We fundamentally believe at the DTO that the technology is cheap, um, it's the people that are dear to us, and we want to be able to optimize that. So PaaS, for us, eliminates entire classes of problems that we just don't have to think about anymore. Very simple things like, you know, how do I make my application available? Or maybe more complex things like, how do I actually recover from an outage? Because failure is inevitable in these sort of situations. So this is uh, our first outage selfie that we took um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of weeks into running our, uh, running our platform. It's like, you know, everyone say downtime. And uh, the interesting thing about this particular incident was that the time to detection when we were running on our Cloud Foundry platform was about four minutes. The time to recovery was about 12 minutes overall. Not too shabby. But the most interesting stat in all of this was that the amount of human intervention that was required to be able to recover from this particular platform outage was zero. The platform itself just self-healed. And by the time we worked out what was going on, it had fixed itself. That's a pretty good position to be in from an operational, uh, as part of an ops team. So PaaS frees up your teams to be able to focus on the bigger picture and think about the bigger picture about what's happening within your organization as, as a whole, which is really important to be able to free up the people with really significant operational experience to help the organization as a whole learn what they know so that the organization as a whole is able to improve. And hopefully, they'll be able to help the organization learn how to deliver clearer, simpler, and faster services. Thank you very much.